If you have watched the uh, first exercise in the boot camp series, uh, you'll recall that I said that in initially filming the exercises, I uh, had uh, not understood the time constraints for YouTube and had recorded quite a bit of explanatory footage that I ended up simply abandoning. And I said that I would, uh, when I got around to it, uh, go through that footage and, and put together a video of these explanatory things. started looking at that and decided that rather than do a hodgepodge of all these little clips that may or may not uh, tie together very well, I would just uh, do it um, afresh. I kind of have a list here of the things I want to cover. Uh, something that's important to mention is, now as a potter I really am, you could say, entirely self-taught. I started out by taking a very basic hobbyist class and uh, none of the uh, basic techniques that I was taught in that class uh, uh, lasted uh, more than a year after I started making pots on my own. Uh, all the techniques and all the understanding uh, that I have of what I'm doing uh, have come from uh, experimentation and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Now when I started teaching classes a few years ago, uh, at a certain point I was surprised. To, I, I started having several students tell me well, you're telling me to forget everything my other teachers have taught me and do it entirely differently. And uh, I was a little surprised by that. I kind of thought that any uh, good thrower would be telling you the same stuff. I don't know what other teachers are telling you. Uh, it's not my purpose to contradict them. Uh, on the other hand, I'm telling you what works for me. And I've uh, had pretty good success with uh, students uh, doing things the way I tell them to. One thing I do know from observation and from personal experience, there's a lot of different ways to make clay move. A lot of different ways. And every potter who ends up uh, being a competent thrower is going to have his or her own way of doing it. And uh, it works to one extent or another. Uh, definitely there are techniques that are better and techniques that are worse. Uh, there's no question about that. I, I have done a lot of experimentation uh, with throwing. It's kind of something that I just do. I say, gee, I wonder what would happen if I did this differently. And um, I've done that over the years. Like I say, it's been like 46 years now since I started doing this, and uh, boy, you know, I can do things, for years I've been able to do things that in my early years I would have thought weren't even possible to make clay do that kind of stuff. To me, effective throwing revolves all around a couple of things. Uh, that would be understanding clay, and understanding structure. As far as understanding clay is concerned, I'm not going to, any any serious student I had would have to sit through the whole what I would call the clay lecture, which goes on for, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. And it's important stuff to understand. I will uh, tell you regarding understanding clay, something I always tell students, that the, the way you should think of clay is that on a microscopic level, what it is, it's like a mixture of kind of irregularly shaped flagstones. That would be a flat stone. And a thick, sticky mortar. And initially all these stones are just kind of in a jumbled mass. And uh, what happens, again, on a microscopic level, because these stones, from our perspective, are dust just dust. But at that microscopic level they're little tiny stones. And through the way you treat the clay 
and the pressure of your hands, what you do is you force them to squirm around inside with this thick sticky mortar and figure out how they can best fit together. And that's what is involved in what I call building a strong wall. It's a huge, huge uh, hurdle to cross if you haven't gotten to that point yet. One more thing about these stones, every single one of them is polar. It has a magnetic north and south. And you make them squirm around enough and figure out how to fit together and you'll even get them to line up magnetically which builds a wall of incredible cohesion and that's what's at play in uh, stretching the clay uh, as in the satellite dish bowl or in the swollen form it's an amazing uh, property of clay and it's because of the clay way uh, clay works okay Getting on to the videos in particular, explanatory material, starting with putting a ball of clay on the wheel. Now I looked at a number of throwing videos on YouTube and what I was surprised by is that everybody I watched took the ball of clay and threw it onto the wheel head. Uh, I, I work I've worked for years, three days a week, at a, at a commercial pottery in my neighborhood as a thrower. And they, they do tours, and I remember one <clears throat> person on a tour once asking me why I didn't throw the clay onto the wheelhead like other potters do. And my reaction is that, you know, boy, if anybody can ever show me a good reason why you should do that, I'll start doing it. There are actually are good reasons not to, and I'll elaborate on that. Uh, this gets this this gets kind of complicated. Basically, if you actually want the clay to start out in the center of the wheel, you're better off placing it there than throwing it and hoping that you hit the dead center. Uh, the uh, there's more to it than that, and I'm not going to go into it. This has to do with a lot of with understanding clay. But depending on how you've wedged the clay or how it's been prepped, if it's come out of a pug mill, there's a specific way, direction, that you want the clay to put be on the wheel for the sake of the strength of the bottom of your pot to resist bottom cracking. And um, that's, I'll leave that out. That's too complicated to worry about at this point. Still talking about um, putting a ball of clay on the wheel. You'll notice that in the videos they start with a clay that's been pounded pretty well into a ball. Now, that's for your benefit. Uh, no, I don't ordinarily do that. Uh, I will place the clay the way I want it in the center of the wheel, but uh, as far as turning it into a relatively well-rounded uh, clump of clay, no, I wouldn't ordinarily do that. But if you're trying to learn to do this, that works to your advantage. Let's move on to centering. Uh, first thing I have to say about centering, there's two parts to it. One of them is rudimentary and I don't have any magic trick for making it happen, uh, which is making the clay stand still in the center of the wheel. Uh, what I generally tell students about that, I don't know, it's like a switch in your head that when it's in one position, you're letting the clay push you around, and when it's in the other position, it's like, no, you know, I'm I'm the one in charge here. I've occasionally said in class, it's like, it's like uh, when uh, mom or dad says, because I said so. That's the whole reason. I'm the one calling the shots here. That may be something you might not be able to relate to. I don't know. Uh, that I can't help you with. Other than that, uh, the centering as I explained in that first video, that's the best I can explain it and demonstrate it. I have only taught it in class. This is the way I'm teaching centering now. I find it phenomenally effective. And it's going to vary from student to student. In a class, I guide a student's hands through it 
And when I do that, uh, <laughs> you, the student can actually feel what the heck is going on inside the clay. And that's going to vary with the uh, amount of natural sensitivity you have in your hands. And that's something that varies from individual to individual. But uh, however strong or weak you may by nature be in this category, this is a, a capacity that develops through use. The more you encounter feeling what's going on in the clay, the more your hands start to understand it. R regarding the opening, uh, the way I do it, like I say, you don't need to open the way I do. Uh, there are two other openings that I've seen that are perfectly good openings. And the real common one is the thumb opening. Thumb opening is a good opening. However, you want to be doing it so that your hands are fully in contact <clears throat> with the clay inside and out and over the top. You want to take advantage of being able to exert compression on the clay as you open it. A lot of people are doing the thumb opening don't do that. You want to try and do that. Uh, another opening that I've seen that is a good opening and I, I've only seen a couple of people do this and it's really kind of cute and a very uh, kind of bizarre hand position and it's really a, a clumsy way, a comparatively clumsy way of doing exactly what I do with my opening. Uh, and mine readily turns into the first pull, whereas this other one doesn't. All three of them have two things in common. One, you're actually using the centered ball of clay to stabilize your hands. You're focusing on what you've already centered as this is my this is where my stability is coming from. And the other thing, which with the thumb opening you have to be doing it right, the way I explained it for this to happen, is they're taking advantage of and closing and squeezing the clay to make it move. And that's like a fundamental element of how you want to treat clay, uh, if it's at all possible concept of enclosing and squeezing is something you've uh, experienced if you've ever uh, gotten accustomed to uh, resetting the lip of a pot after a pull. Uh, it's something that uh, you need to understand and make work for you. And uh, in the opening I do, it adds the third element of enclosing and squeezing and extruding. You're enclosing a certain amount of clay and squeezing it so much that you're squeezing clay out of the one place it can get out. Uh, in the case of the opening I do, you're extruding the wall below as you come up by squeezing the clay that you have enclosed in your hands. Anyway, uh, how you open is up to you. Let me see what else I've got here. Uh, I guess it looks like this is going to run on to uh, two sections. Uh, so uh, we'll pick up the next section where we left off here.